So now we want to kind of talk about, you know, how this works at one of the largest companies in the history of the world, Disney. Yeah, so this is uh, what I was speaking to earlier is, you know, data science is kind of the intersection of all of these foundations. Um, at the base of everything, of all of these models and predictive analytics, AI is math and statistics. That's how, you know, all of these uh, models are built. And the issue with that is with traditional just math and statistics is that in order to actually leverage these and apply these concepts to big data and find patterns and relationships that are meaningful um, beyond you know, what you can do on, in an Excel sheet, um, we actually need to be able to have the computer science background to actually leverage these tools and develop the programs that allow us to run these mathematical models on uh, such large data sets. Um, and of course, I think with any discipline, really, there is the aspect of having uh, business domain knowledge as well, because, you know, without that guidance, we don't know what to look for. <laughs> if you just throw us a giant data set of, you know, numbers and uh, formulas, we still need some direction to, uh, to determine what we should even be looking for, what we're trying to model, you know, what is the actual use case for leveraging any of these technologies. So, yeah, data science is basically the intersection of all three of these areas um you have to have enough understanding and practice in all three of these disciplines um which really just means that you know i'm not an expert in any of the areas <laughs> alone but i know enough about all three of them to um to put something together <laughs> yeah and so with the actual team uh, a typical team is composed of all of these different disciplines. So data engineers, um, they're the people who really build the systems to actually clean and process all of the data. And um, they do a lot of the work that is involved with like feature engineering, like Jeff was talking about earlier. How do we actually get all of this data into a digestible form that can then be used for modeling? So this is a huge piece um, of work that is required for modeling that often gets overlooked. Uh, but it is, you know, really the fundamental piece of any model and kind of the, the key to having a successful model as well. Uh, data scientists are typically the ones that are developing the model. So they're actually trying to build up the model to predict um, outputs for behavior and really optimize for you know whatever metric we're trying to look for and or whatever we're trying to predict for. And then there's also this kind of new emerging um, area of machine learning engineers. So I think that in the earlier days, we sort of relied on data scientists to just figure out all of these things. <laughs> but as we're dealing with more and more complex systems and more and more data, we're starting to see that we need more and more um, engineering support to actually deploy these models. So these pipelines can get very complex, right? There's a ton of data, um, Some depending on your use case, you might have billions of users. We need to think about latency. We need to think about how regularly we train these models and how quickly we can run inference on these. And machine learning engineers are sort of trying to take that role of ensuring that entire pipeline can be set up from start to finish and can actually deploy something in a production level environment so that we don't have to worry about uh, latency concerns or you know model drift. And then ultimately there's the product manager, uh, which I touched on earlier, who you know works very closely with the rest of the team to actually help prioritize business requirements and make sure that uh, the model is doing what we are hoping to do. And related, no, our, oh, sorry, related, Annie, we had a question from the prior section that's kind of related to some of that, where uh, Dave mentioned this question of, you know, how much is, how much do we create a feedback loop here where like the kind of movies we're even producing in the first place are actually just a result of trying to like feed an algorithm and like, what's the role in the product manager for navigating that type of feedback loop? Yeah, I think that um, the we try to keep we try to still have you know teams that are dedicated to 
creation, right? Like the editorial teams, they're, we try to still have them isolated so that they're thinking about, you know, what is the content that we need to be producing. And so while the personalization teams do try to put that content in front of people to get more viewership, I think that we still try to keep some separation so that, you know, the content teams get to do what they think is, uh, is important and create the type of work that they think um, people want to see, you know, beyond what the recommendation algorithms are showing people. And, and um, Jose had asked a question kind of about some of the safety issues. Like we've seen, we've seen personalization go bad. And like there's, there was an example from years ago of a mother finding out her daughter was pregnant because she got an email from Target that predicted that she, based on her shopping behavior that she was probably expecting. Um, how, how do you think about whether it's in the context of Disney or even just personally kind of creating safety mechanisms to prevent some of those kind of darker sides or, or misuse cases of personalization? Yeah, I think that in the earlier days, um, we were not as aware of, you know, we weren't as careful with those kind of issues. And so we would tend towards sort of throwing in all the data that we had about a specific user. And I think that more and more because of these issues that we're seeing um, and the privacy concerns, we're sort of actually moving away from that and trying to use as little information as possible um, to still be able to customize an experience. And so more and more you'll see that a lot of the, you know, sen more sensitive data is thrown out of data sets completely. Um, we're trying to, and, you know, with some of the bias concerns that we'll get into a little bit later as well, it's, I think that the field is moving towards trying to remove as much sensitive information as possible so that we can avoid uh, these kind of issues arising. So, so I want to give Nicole a chance to ask a question, but I just want to, one of the big points we're trying to make, guys, is it takes a lot of money and people to do this right. Um, and, you know, I, I'm on the same chat uh, for a lot of business owners that Nicole is, and there's just a ton of very small businesses that are trying to create custom solutions, leveraging data and AI, that uh, if they probably just sat tight for like six months, the tools would be built for them uh, at a much uh, lower cost. And just to give you an example, um, Annie shared with me that she has over 20 people on a team that's dedicated simply on how to organize video content from one ESPN video feed. So the, the amount of time, money, and resources that really is required to do this well uh, is out of reach for most small businesses, which is a perfect segue to Nicole's question. Well, and I want to say what Manuel um, asked on here too, as part of this. So his question was, what, if you, for a company that doesn't have a whole team um, and you showed the different types of people on the team, who would you hire first and what responsibilities? If you could hire one person, what responsibilities? And then my question is, um, if you think that AI will make this analysis more accessible for the average business owner. And so, you know, for people like we don't have 20, 20 analysts, you know, um, and we're lucky to have one or a part-time analyst on something, um, what are you seeing there as far as efficiencies? And if you could hire one person and use a tool, what do you, what would you do first? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. And I would say if I had to, if my resources were constrained and I were just trying to add one hire <laughs> available, I mean, this is probably going to sound like a cop out, but you know, I would try to find the person who is the most generalist of those, of all those disciplines that I described. So, you know, there are, whether you call that a data scientist or an engineer, um, there are people who, individuals who can do all of those things, um, both from data engineering all the way to model deployment. That being said, I think that I would try to find someone who is well-versed enough in all of those areas to understand the capabilities um, of all of these tools and technologies, but also just comfortable enough interfacing with some of these other products that can 
do these things for you, right? You don't need someone who's going to code a model from scratch. You don't need someone who's going to be able to deploy that um, on AWS or you know Azure or anything like that. You can leverage some of these existing tools um, and just knowing the data that you have and knowing the capabilities that of what you can do with it is enough to kind of get you started so that you can then, if you're comfortable sending your data to a third party, they can provide, you know, the if whether you're trying to do personalization or any other type of modeling, they can send you back the uh, recommendations and you can kind of, you know, not have to worry about the actual deployment and infrastructure that is required to house a system like that. Okay, thank you. Well, you know, we could keep going and I would love to, but there's, um, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we end uh, on time and give enough time for Nicole to show off some of the tools that she's going to demo for us.